Thank you guys so much for being here today. Thank you for uh, coming and listening to me filibuster for the next 45 minutes or so. But I want to get started with, you know, just asking a question. Who here likes money? <laughs> Who here likes doing math? Oh. Oh. OK, you see, it's a little quiet for the second one. But I want to remind you guys that I am your BFF. We're going to talk about money, but it also is going to come with math because that is how we are going to quantify what we deserve, how much we are making, how much we are spending, how much we are saving. So I'll take a seat now. I want to start today off by sharing three really key stats because sometimes I feel like when I make content, you guys are like, she pulled this information like out of thin air. Did she make this up? And no, we are going to be rooted in science. So very first off, um, we're going to talk about making money. We're going to talk a little bit about your careers, um, why that's important. And unfortunately for us, the next 15 minutes, we're going to talk about some uncomfortable truths. So first and foremost, a new survey published in June of 2023 um, of 913 women across four different industries, law, nonprofits, higher education, and healthcare, so very, very different jobs, found that women across all age cohorts reported being on the receiving end of age-related judgment that implied they were unfit for the job. Just show of hands. Who in this room has ever felt like they were treated as a less than qualified person at work for being too young? It's a lot of hands. What about people who have ever felt like they have been treated unfairly or less than at work for being too old? Don't even think about getting pregnant, by the way. Seriously, that's, go ahead and just say bye to your career. And, and I say this in jest, right? Because unfortunately, regardless of how smart or accomplished or amazing you are, for the most part, we as women are often going to be underestimated, underappreciated, and taken for granted just because we don't necessarily fit the mold of what a great competent employee looks like. And I hate to say that, but it's true. So I want to talk about a key takeaway and why this stat is really important. They are going to hate you for being too young until they hate you for being too pregnant. And then they're going to hate you for being too old. So please do that thing that you are afraid to do. You're nervous to ask that question in that meeting because you're saying, oh, well, what if they think I'm stupid? They already think you're stupid, OK? You're not. You are so bright. You are talented. You are incredible. Ask the question. You deserve to have that answer. That's not illegal for you to want to know more, to be able to learn at your job. There is an opportunity for you to take on a new territory or delve into a new topic or take over a new team. You're too scared to do it. Why? Because you're not going to be as good? Well, they're probably going to think that anyway. You might as well try. You owe it to you and yours to make that money, to bring that confidence to the workplace. Because you know what happens when we do? As women climb this ladder at the workplace, regardless of what their job is, when you're at the top, you get to start making those decisions. And suddenly, the big tippy-toppy manager is no longer one that their decision-making is clouded in bias. It's another strong, powerful woman looking down and taking care of the other women that come behind them. So not only are you the trailblazer, but you're also the person who gives an example of what truly is possible. It's really, really easy to dream, right? But it's so hard to see yourself in a position where someone who looks like you has never succeeded. So unfortunately for a lot of us, sometimes we have to be the first person to do that. But I'm telling you right now, you can. I said I was going to put lotion on because these cards get a little sticky, but uh, I got it. Don't worry, guys. Um, now we're going to talk about specifically a number, OK? Women are more likely to bag $100,000 jobs despite fewer applications. Specifically, fewer women than men apply for jobs that pay a total annual salary of $100,000 or more, but those who do 
are more likely to get hired than their male counterparts, according to fresh data from recruiting software company ICIMS. When I first heard about this stat, my initial reaction was, yay, we're better, we're smarter, we get these jobs, you know, even though we're applying less. And then I took a second and it sunk in. Do you guys know what I'm gonna say? Yes, that is the follow-up point. But the real frustrating point to me was, why are we applying less often? And now we're gonna talk about that overqualification point. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Okay, so think about the last time you saw a job that was really cool, a job you really wanted, and it had 10 bullet points of things you needed to hit before you were qualified for the job. How many bullet points would you guys feel like you person ooh, sorry, personally feel like you needed to accomplish before you would apply for this job? Just start throwing out some numbers for me. Okay, okay. The number that we heard the most was 10. I'm gonna tell you right now, if you hit all 10 bullet points, you are overqualified. Because I'm gonna tell you what the likely man who sits next to you at work is thinking. He's also scrolling. He might have even seen that exact same job posting, right? He's looking through these 10 bullet points. He probably hits three, maybe four on a good day. That same man is looking at that job being like, this is the perfect job for me. Who better than me? I got this, I got this. And that comes from a place of being told your entire life that you are capable, that you are deserved, that you are supposed to be the person in power, the person in charge. And unfortunately, we tell a lot of our little boys, it's okay to take big risks, it's okay to like skid your knees, just jump for the next monkey bar, whatever. But we tell our girls, instead of taking risks, instead of trying to be powerful, we tell them to be good. We tell them that it's important to be nice and likable and perfect. And that makes a lot of us not feel confident enough to take these big swings because a lot of us don't feel confident doing things we're not already good at. But how do you become good at things? You do things you've never done before. So the key takeaway here is please apply for jobs you are unqualified for. I'm not saying you are more or less qualified than the guy sitting next to you. I'm saying you're all equally unqualified. Somebody's got to get the job though, and I'd rather a lot of the faces in this room get paid and then be able to use those dollars to support women-founded businesses, to be able to build your retirement funds, to be able to be really mindful and thoughtful and intentional with your spending than for it to go to another guy. Final stat that is really, really important, 80% of women get pay bumps when they request one. Woo! But only 46% of women have requested a raise throughout their careers. I really don't like the story that tells, right? Um, what I think is important here, again, is to show that most of us are getting yeses. We're just afraid to ask for them. And again, this is not your fault. We've been told our entire lives it's rude to brag. Do you guys remember, I don't know if this is a shared experience, but my mom would be like, Vivian, don't be so boastful. In Chinese, there's a phrase of basically being like thick-skinned or uh, bullheaded of when you're like really, really on into yourself. I was obviously very, very into myself as a child. Um, but I'm telling you, it's okay to brag. In particular, when you have a brag book to back it up. So. Who in here understands and knows what a brag book is? Oh, we only got a couple hands, so this is gonna be a good one. All right, I want all of you guys to take out your phones, okay? And on your email, you're gonna make a new folder and you're gonna label it brag book and the year, 2023. Next year, it'll be 2024. And what you're gonna do is any time that a client emails and is like, oh my God, couldn't have done this without Kristen. Or your boss is like, 
Jessica, you're so amazing, better than all of the other coworkers. Or an internal team is like, wow, like, Carol, you crushed this project. Sorry, that's like, I don't know why I do that voice, but I just do. Um, anytime that happens, you're gonna forward all of those emails into your brag book. And that way, when you get to mid-year reviews, when you get to end of year reviews, who has to write those really annoying self-assessments where you're like three positives and two things I can work on? You're gonna take all of the positives you already have a laundry list of in your brag book. It's gonna be so easy. You're just gonna be ticking things off onto that. So one, you're gonna save yourself a lot of headache when having to fill out the paperwork that's just kind of boring, but you gotta do it. And two, these are now quantifiable measures and qualitative examples of times you've succeeded. If you have a job that's a little bit more in the field or in person, you can certainly make a manila folder, put it into that little drawer at your desk. You have photos or examples or letters, put them there. Whether it's a physical brag book or a digital brag book, this is your key and your tool that you're gonna be able to really point to at the end of the year and say to your manager, look at all of the goals that we have set together. These are all the things that I've managed to hit. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is why you should pay me, because we talked about this, I made it happen, I did this, and because of the quality of my work, I believe a raise of XYZ is commensurate. So don't be afraid to ask, don't be afraid to brag, especially if you've got the receipts to back it up. Okay, so did we all enjoy talking, learning a little bit about making more money? Yes. yes, okay. Now we're gonna talk about my favorite activity, spending money, a lot more fun. Um, but can anybody tell me, or just raise your hand, have you ever bought something that you were like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited to buy this, and then you like checked your closet two weeks later, you're like, I've never worn this. And you were like, and it was kind of expensive. And then, yeah, literally all of us. And. Two months later, you're like, oh, I still haven't worn it. Two years later, you're like, oh my god, the tag is still on it. What do I do? Uh, yeah, we've all been there. We've all made that mistake, but we are wiser now, and we are going to utilize something called the is it worth it equation. And this is a fun modern take on the value-based spending formula, okay? I think a lot of us don't understand the value of a dollar. And I don't mean to sound like you're a dollar, like you don't understand the value of a dollar. It's not that. We all work very hard. But you don't understand the value of a dollar because it's really hard to visualize. So instead of saying, okay, I ordered a pad thai delivery last night. I got the Thai iced tea and a side of spring rolls that all cost you know, roughly $38. You are going to take the cost of any purchase, whether it's a good, whether it's a service, and you are going to divide it by your hourly take-home pay. If you have an hourly job, this is pretty easy. Just back into what you make after taxes. If you have a salary job, go ahead and just divide that overall number by the 52 weeks in a year, 40 hours a week, and again, back in to see what your paycheck is after taxes. But this is helpful because instead of that pad thai costing $38, Suddenly it's an hour and a half of work at your desk. It's an hour and a half of talking to clients. It's an hour and a half of writing reports. Is that still worth it to you? This equation is so helpful because it helps us, regardless of who we are or how we like to spend our money, understand value. For me, this equation has been super helpful because I have come to realize that I don't care how expensive that vacation is. It was worth it. It was so worth it. And I love going out to eat. That food, totally worth it. And that pad thai that I ordered, I tried making pad thai at home once. Didn't turn out so good. The noodles all stuck together, looked like mashed potatoes. And for on the flip side, it also made me realize that I absolutely cannot stomach paying full price for clothes. I always want to look cute. Look at how cute I look. I always want to be wearing the newest designer, the latest styles, but I really think paying full price is something that I can't justify on a per hour basis of having to do my job. Obviously we're here, Marshalls is an amazing place where you can find great high quality items 
for quite a lot less. And that makes it for me a lot more worth it on my per hour work cost. So I use the is it worth it equation anytime I'm going to buy something. Try it the next time. You're like, should I get it? Should I not? And for the most part, since using it, I have not had a moment where I'm like, I regret buying this. And you just never want to have that feeling because your spending is OK. You are allowed to enjoy spending money. But just be intentional and mindful and purposeful. And you are going to feel a lot better about those dollars leaving your pocket to get you something in return. OK. Now we are going to talk about something a little shall I say, spicy, OK? So uh, I had a the, the Delulu lemonade earlier from the uh, Lavender Room. You guys should try it. It's scrumptious. Um, but we're going to talk about something called the are you Delulu equation. Because there have been times where I have been looking at something, and I'm like, I need this. I need this so bad. I need it with my entire being. And it was just the craziest thing ever. I'm not going to name names, but the other day, I saw a tabloid photo of a celebrity. And she was carrying a Himalayan croc skin bag. Just take a guess. And, and there's quite a few fashionistas in here, so I'm like scared that you guys are actually going to get it right. But like, take a guess at how much this purse costs. $22,000. $22,000. <laughs> oh, she wants me to give her the dimensions. Um, just rough guesses. 70, 70, 75, 22? 40, 100? It was $200,000, guys. $200,000 is a house. And listen, I'm not crazy. I don't need the Himalayan Croc skin, but I started Googling. Oh, just a regular model, the, the general medium size. It doesn't got to be the biggest one or the cute little small one that everyone likes. 18000 Do I have $18,000? Sure. Would it be much better kept in my retirement account? Would it be much better utilized as my emergency fund? Would it be a better use as a down payment on a vehicle that could get me from point A to point B or as a down payment on part of a home? Yeah. So to bring myself back to Earth, what I do is utilize the RU Delulu equation. What you do is you take the cost of the good or service, and I divide it by her net worth. I'm going to tell you the celebrity's net worth, and some of you are going to be like, I know who the celebrity is. Um, the celebrity's net worth was $1.7 billion. When I did the math, that is roughly 0.01% of her net worth. When I multiply 0.01% by my net worth, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, it didn't equate to even the lower tier bag, not even close. Worked out to be roughly. $200. And that's OK. And it reminded me that you know, just because I can doesn't mean that I necessarily should. And this is a great equation, especially as we are constantly on social media consuming some of the most just luxurious images you've ever seen in your entire life. I asked myself the other day, I was like, why don't I fly private? You can't afford it, girly. Like, why don't I have this bag? You can't afford it, girly. Like, why don't I have these pieces of jewelry? You can't afford it, girly. And that's OK. Because guess what? With $200, that $200 can go a really long way. And I can still get a bag that I very much like. Yes, it's not the Croc skin. But again, it serves a wonderful purpose. It's beautiful. It costs significantly less than $200. And $200 can go a very long way at our friends at Marshalls. So, you can use that money, regardless of the sum, to help you feel as confident as you can walking into your office, walking into that hot date you might have next week, or walking into a speaking event in New York City in an incredible space and feel just as good about yourself without having to put yourself in a really precarious financial position just because you saw a celebrity do that for them, because their money is a little different than ours. And that's OK. And last equation, this is my favorite one. And this isn't necessarily spending today, so don't boo me, OK? Like, this is 
today you taking care of future you, which I am a big proponent for, we are going to calculate the I have enough number. Okay? I want everybody just to close your eyes for a second. Okay? And picture your happily ever after. Your perfect year. Maybe you are only 30 and you're already retired. You are living in an airstream. You make your own shoes. You grow your own crops. You get to backpack around Yosemite. Seems like a pretty nice life for some people. Not me, not me. I'm not outdoorsy at all. But some of else of you are probably envisioning you have a beautiful vacation home in the summer. Rover, your golden retriever, is running around the backyard with your big pool. This is your vacation home. Your primary residence, obviously, uh, is, you know, just chilling. Your two children, they are in college. They call you every day because they love you so much. <laughs> and you have a wonderful life, right? And I'm making up these random examples. Some of you guys are in the south of France, like, you know, at a table, whatever. But we all have a happily ever after. And we do not get to hit our goals unless we set them. So with that number, everybody, if you can just take out your little calculators. Remember when our high school teachers were like, you're not always going to have a calculator in your pocket. It's like, yeah, I do, actually. Um, OK, type in roughly what you think your happily ever after is going to cost you. OK, everybody have that inputted? Are your guys' numbers really high? Is that why you guys are laughing? Um, and now, I want you to divide that number per year, per year, per year. And then you're going to divide that number by 0 0.04. We will come back to why that number is important. OK? It, divide by 0 0.04. I know for some of my non-math girlies, you're going to be confused, but the number that it gets spit out is a bigger number. OK. Can I just, can some of you guys just shout out what your numbers are? Five million. Five million. 25 million. 25 million? 50, oh wow, okay. No, okay, no, no, no. This number that you have on your calculator is your I have enough number. And what this number represents is to live your ultimate happily ever after, forever, this is how much money you're gonna wanna have invested, okay? <laughs> Some of y'all are living crazy, you know. <laughs> um, but remember when we were dividing by 0 0.04? 0 0.04 represents 4%. And 4%, roughly speaking from the you know, finance community, is what you are consistently able to get as a conservative return on your investments. So when you take all of this money that you have, this big number that you have on your calculators, you are able to invest that, and if that can consistently earn 4% every year, and every year you only take out the amount that that money has earned, and you never touch that initial nest egg, you can live off of that sum forever. You will never, ever have to step back foot into an office. You will never have to work again, unless you would like to. What I find to be really interesting about this equation is that for some of us, like my friend here with the $5 million I have enough number, it helps you realize that like, your happily ever after is not that far-fetched. You can get there. You can. And it helps us understand what we really value in our lives. I know some of y'all in the back, were like you guys are spending like crazy for this happily ever after, but that's OK. I, what I like to do, every two or three years, I will take you know, literally 15 minutes and calculate what is a bare bones happily ever after for me? What is the ultra luxury I get to do every single thing I want happily ever after? And more realistically, what is that happy medium? I calculate all three numbers. And this helps me make really, really strategic decisions when it comes to my money. Because once I hit the bare bones number, it means that I can downshift a little bit in my career. Maybe I want to prioritize my family. Maybe I want to prioritize a kid. When I hit the next number, maybe I just stop working entirely. Maybe I start picking up philanthropy. I don't necessarily need money to be coming in the door. 
And if I really hit this big luxury number, man, you will never hear from me again. <laughs> but again, this is just goal setting. This is a really fun way to goal set. And I get the question all the time. It's like, how do I broach finances with a partner? Do this. Do this fun little exercise. Ask them what their happily ever after looks like. It's not as stressful as, show me your credit score. Show me your W-2. I want to see what your pay stub is. This is just a fun way to have conversations about money. And as all of us probably already know, when you talk more about money, we all benefit. It helps to build our confidence in the workplace because we know what we deserve. It helps to build our confidence when we're shopping around for important things like a mortgage or a car loan. We get more competitive pricing because we know what we should be getting compared to our friends. And it helps us just to be more confident in how we communicate. For so long, we have been told it's rude and tacky and taboo to talk about money. But you see the guys teeing off on hole three, you know, driving their little golf carts doing it. What makes it embarrassing for us? Nothing. It's a little bit of a marketing ploy. We should be talking about money. Talk to money with your friends. Talk to money with your partners. And the more we talk about money, the better we are going to be with it. OK. Now. We are on to the third segment of our fun-filled session. And I believe everybody should have a piece of cardstock um, sort of near their chairs, underneath their chairs, wherever you might have put it. Um, and we have moved on to phase three. So we talked a little bit about stats that are important to keep in mind when we're making money, how to spend our money wisely, whether it's for today or for the future. And now we are going to talk about saving money. I know it's not as sexy as phase two, but come on. We got to do it. Um, and what I want you guys to write down is a savings goal that you currently have, how much you need in total, how much you currently have set aside, and why this goal is important to you. Feel free. Do not put your names on these. It's Cool, they are totally anonymous. We will be shuffling them up and sharing a couple stories. Or we might have some people raise their hands if they feel compelled to share. But everybody, please take, call it, I'll give you like 90 seconds to just write this down. Oh, wait. Sorry, is there a time frame for like, how much you want to save? Like there is no time, like there's no wrong answer on this. This could be something that you are saving for the next six months. This could be something you're saving for the next six years. This could be something you're saving for the next 60 years. And when you guys are done, if you could all pass, flip them over, and then pass your cards to your right, my left. Um, pass them all the way to your buddies at the end of the row. And then from the folks in the back, once your line leader has collected all the pieces of paper, we'll pass them all the way to the front. And we will share a couple of these. Does that make sense? Or I can just come get them. To, to your right, to my left. Perfect. Yes. We're just collecting for a second. My squad up here writing me a novella. I love it. <laughs> Oh, notes? OK, you can keep it. You can keep it. That's OK. Thank you. Perfect. I have three. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, wait, uh, Anna, can I have this bin? OK, we're going to shuffle these. As you can see, I am not a card shark. But uh, we're going to shuffle. These are not, this not doing as good as I thought. This, this worked out a lot better in my head, actually. Um, 
But that's fine. You know, you live and you learn. Okay. I'm going to pick a couple of these at random. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I feel like I want to get a couple like good diversified ones, but these are all such really good answers. So <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect, amazing. Okay, so I'm looking through these answers, and I think a lot of you are going to find some commonalities with what I'm seeing in here. Um, let me just read a couple of them to you that I think are so so important. Somebody said they wanted to save $25,000, and they already had $3,000 set aside. And, I, and the question was, why is this important to you? Stability, freedom. If, have, you, have any of you guys ever felt like you couldn't leave a situation, maybe it was a toxic job, a really icky ex, something like that, because you just didn't have the funds? I think what a lot of these answers are gonna show us is that Money doesn't exist in a vacuum. We don't want to be rich to be rich. We want to be rich because we want to have agency. We want to have power. We want to be able to make our own decisions. Somebody said, I want to save for my new home with much more space. I already have $20,000 set aside. And this goal is important to me because I want my family to have space to reset, I think, and feel comfortable. Again, what are we learning from this? Money is not because we want to have a golden toilet. Money is important because we want security. We want comfort. Um, let me see. These are just a couple good ones. Somebody said, I want to save $100,000. I already have $35,000 set aside. This goal is important to me because I grew up in a household where money was scarce, and I want my future kids to feel stable and secure. We joke and we talk about money and we talk about private planes and expensive bags, but don't we find it interesting? And I'm telling you, this entire stack, I was looking through all of these answers, not a single one of you wrote down Himalayan Croc skin bag. <laughs> I'm just saying, like I can zoom, like I zoom through it. I know none of you wrote that. I think what we are coming to realize about why money is so important to us is because it allows us to have the confidence in our lives to make those decisions that are so, so important to us. It's not about trying to flex. It's not about doing better than your friends. It has always been about providing yourself and your loved ones the best life that money can buy. And what I say when it comes to saving is you're not doing it just to do it, you're doing it for future you. You're doing it for your family, you're doing it for your loved ones, you're doing it for your future kids, maybe that golden retriever named Rover. <laughs> we, are, we all want Rover to have a backyard, right? Come on, it's cruel not to. Um, and I think this is a very grounding moment for all of us to realize that a lot of us have similar goals. We are more similar than we are different when it comes to our money and there is something that we can all learn from each other. So I say everybody gets a money rating, right? On a scale of one to 10, you're good at money on a certain part of that scale. You know, maybe you are really confident. You are really good with your money. You're in a good spot. You're an eight or a nine. Eight or nines can help sixes and sevens. Sixes and sevens can help fours and fives. Fours and fives can still help one, twos, and threes. And I think we all have a lot of value, education, and skill to provide to our friends and our family a lot more than we actually think. And when they say things like, women are frivolous spenders, we are not money savvy, we need to cut back, that avocado toast is why you can't afford a home, just remember, that's not true. You guys are a perfect representation of that. And we are all trying to get to a place of comfort, stability, security, and confidence. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, OK, so 
So now we're going to um, have a quick audience Q&A. Um, if you guys don't ask me some questions, I will cry until you do. Um, but OK, great. Yeah, I think this is a really challenging conversation, right? Because the answer comes from a place of privilege and security. If you know you don't need that job, that one gig, you are able to negotiate more aggressively because you are coming from a position of power. Um, for example, when I was negotiating uh, the rent on an apartment, and I knew I still had 30 more days on my apartment, I can, you know, I can be a little bit more flexible and be like, if this guy's not going to give me the price I deserve, I can walk away. However, if I'm on day, I have two days left before I'm out to like be kicked out of my apartment, like I, I might have to make concessions. So what I say is typically, especially if you are a 1099 employee, your income might not necessarily be consistent every two weeks. It could be chunky or it could be great. Set a little bit of that emergency fund aside that provides you career flexibility. Ask for more. And in some cases, when a client or a partner really doesn't value and is not offering you what you're worth, just know that it's OK to walk away. There have certainly been instances in my creator career where I've had partners basically being like, mm, OK, we want 20 videos, and we're going to give you a water bottle and some candy. And I'm like, <laughs> like what? And you know what happens? When I'm like, absolutely not goodbye, I walk away, they typically, wait, they come running after. And they say, wait, 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 we're sorry. We'll actually try to meet you closer to your number. Sometimes it does take a little bit of a bluff. Like, we as women need to learn that we better be bluffing. Because we oftentimes are our own worst enemies. We negotiate our, against ourselves. And don't be the one to tell yourself no. Let them tell you that. So go in high. Don't be afraid to walk away. And to prepare yourself financially, set something a little bit aside just so that you have a little bit more flexibility when it comes to taking on work that actually values your time and your skills. Of course. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yes. This is tricky because every couple is going to be so, so different. But um, you and I met in LA. and. You know, I think you have a very wonderful career. I'm guessing your partner also does as well. Um, a format that really, really works for us is the yours, mine, and ours, right? So for joint expenses like our rent, our mortgage, or the Wi-Fi bill, or the cell phone bills, or the heating and the electricity, like the stuff that we actually physically share, we pay that out of our hours category. And what we do is when you get most of us these days don't get a physical paper check that's like your paycheck. You get a direct deposit. It just goes straight into your bank account, right? Oftentimes, what you can do in your employer's portal, or you can just set this up as an auto through your bank, is some of that money can automatically be moved into certain accounts. And what you can do is agree on an amount that you're each setting aside to that account. It doesn't have to be a 50-50 split. I personally believe in equity over equality. So if one person makes significantly more, they should help and contribute a little bit more. But have that hours category pay for your joint expenses. That way, you have a yours category, and they have a theirs category. And that's great. You know, And an example for me and my partners, I'm not asking for permission to go get my lashes done. Okay, That's happening every two or three weeks, whether anybody likes it or not. And I get to feel confident about my finances, confident about my spending, because that is money that's set aside in my yours category. On the other hand, my fiance, did you guys know golf is really expensive? <laughs> like, I just found that out like relatively recently. Like, there's greens fees. You sometimes you got to pay for the caddy. You got to pay to rent the little car thing. Like, I obviously don't golf. He can pay for that golf experience, hundreds of dollars, out of his their his account, and that way I don't necessarily need to gripe and complain about it because it's his money. He worked hard. He he's allowed to enjoy it. The hours category covers things like our actual bills, but there's also our savings accounts, our car, our home, our future remodel of the nursery, you know, whatever you want it to be, our retirement account. 
you can certainly set this up in a way that feels really fair and you know equitable to everybody. Um, but again, it really does depend on each couple, especially depending on how the money comes in to the family. Uh, but the number one step is have a conversation, have a money date. Next Friday, be like, hey, let's order a pizza, get a bottle of wine, and let's sit down and actually just hash through it. It's so much more fun than sitting in front of spreadsheets. If you do it over food, I also find that it makes me less irritable. So highly recommend having a money date with your partner. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so sometimes you can do it proportionally, right? So say um, you and I, we share an apartment, right? You make, I'm just using really easy numbers here, you make $200,000 a year. I make $100,000 a year. And the rent is $3,000 a month. It is not an issue, I think, for you to pay $2,000 and me to pay $1,000 towards our rent because it is a proportional and equitable amount. Again, this is gonna differ every single couple. Maybe the person who makes less is comfortable paying a little bit more on certain expenses and a little less on other expenses. Um, but really find a system that works for you and have that conversation before you move in together because it's only gonna be worse if you've gone a certain amount of time and you feel resentful. So no quick equation, but I would say just try to keep it really proportional to what each of you are making um, and asking, you know, just, just being really honest and saying, I'm not personally comfortable spending this amount on rent. I know you make a little bit more, you have longer hours, you might need to live closer to the office. I'm happy to do that for you, but we need to find something within my budget or alternatively, we can split the rent a little bit differently. If they love you, if they're a really good partner, I highly doubt that they're gonna say no. Okay. Yes, please. Oh, you, both of you, I think we have time for both, so it's fine. Like, well, did you say wealth building? Sorry, somebody, okay. Um, I would say, first off, it's like a waterfall. So you want to max out your employer-sponsored retirement fund up to the match. A lot of companies do that. It's free money you're leaving on the table if you're not maxing out. Then you can go and fund an individual retirement account or a Roth IRA, individual retirement account. This is something that you own on your own, not tied to anybody. Then you can complete matching with your, or complete the rest of the max for your employer-sponsored plan. And even after that, you can still continue to save and invest for retirement through an individual brokerage. You aren't getting as many tax breaks. However, again, it's still worth doing, and there is still a slight tax benefit and that you'll end up paying a capital gains tax, which is less than an income tax on what you're physically earning on an ordinary income. So it's just really important to keep doing as much as you can. But at a certain point, if you are already feeling really confident about that, you're maxing everything out, I would actually pose a question to you and say, are you investing in your life in other ways? Do you have hobbies? When's the last time you took a real trip for yourself? When's the last time you did something nice for yourself? Because there were like a, there were like, like a two, three year period in my life where I felt really good because my finances were in great shape. I don't think I'd taken a day off of work and I was so burnt out. I hated like my job. I hated everything. And it's okay to feel like that, but consider how you can then use your finances to really buy back some of that time and buy back some of that life for yourself. So I would say the biggest thing I see, especially in women, is we want to be so perfect and we get paralysis by analysis. So instead of trying to pick the perfect account, pick the perfect investment, you can always utilize a robo-advisor. Um, this is essentially having a financial advisor who's going to pick your investments for you. You take a quick quiz about your money goals, how old you are, how much money you make, what your goal, like what exactly you want to do, like is this money for retirement, is this money you need in 10 years, whatever, and they will pick investments for you. Typically, these robo-advisors charge small-ish management fees, something around 0.25%, which is significantly less than a human financial advisor, which will be somewhere between 1% to 1.25%. And you get it done right away. Because guess what? There's no such thing as a perfect investment. You can't time the market. But being consistent and investing early and often is how you are going to get where you want to be in terms of your financial goals. Of course. And I think there was one last question in the back. I think, Anna, that's the only, we only have time for one? Yeah. Yes. Oh, 
So first and foremost, if you do not have a high yield savings account, you need one, okay? Your bank, this is how they make, they're not doing anything out of the goodness of their heart. Your bank is not a charity, okay? You give me $1,000 to hold at the bank, I then take that $1,000 and I lend it out to somebody. That is somebody's mortgage, that's somebody's car loan, that's you know a personal small business loan, whatever. I lend that money out and I charge, we all know what interest rates are right now, seven, eight percent. I'm making a killing on that. What are you getting, a couple cents? So when you sign up for a high yield savings account, right now, most high yield savings accounts are offering somewhere between four to five percent in annual percentage yield meaning how much you would essentially get. So you put $100 in, at the end of the year, you have $104, $105. There's a ton of great options. I would rather you make a decision today and open one than not. The only wrong answer is truly not opening one up as soon as humanly possible. Thank you so, so much for having me and laughing at my corny dad jokes. I really do appreciate it. Um, and I'll be hanging out. So if you guys want to hang out, I'll still be around. We can chat. Awesome.